Sudarananda and the Buddha sat in meditation, and the Buddha used his spiritual powers to take him to the heavens, where they visited a palace where five hundred goddesses and many servants were working. The heavens were a million times more beautiful than the world of men, and Sudarananda had never seen such beautiful women. Naturally, that he fell in love. Don't you have a leader? He asked, "Who is your master?" Our master hasn't arrived," they said. "He's Shakyamuni Buddha's little brother, Sudarananda. He's left home to cultivate the way, and in the future, he will be reborn with his five hundred goddesses as his wives." Sudarananda was delighted. "I don't think I'll run away after all," he thought. "I cultivate diligently." And get reborn in heaven instead. Sudarananda said to Buddha, "Are the goddesses more beautiful than Sundari, or is she more beautiful than they? Compared to the goddesses, Sundari is as ugly as a monkey." Said Sudarananda. "Which would you prefer?" said the Buddha. "The goddesses," said Sudarananda. "Sundari is beautiful, but the goddesses are out of this world." In the future, you'll be born here," said the Buddha. "Now let's go back and cultivate." So the Rananda meditated day and night, cultivating to be a heavenly lord. The Buddha knew that heavenly blessings have outflows, are not ultimate, and that those who enjoy them can still fall to lower realms. Wishing to wake so the Rananda up, he said, "There's nothing going on today." Would you like to visit the house? I've heard that they aren't very cynic," said Sudarananda. "But if you want to take me there, I'll go." They visited the house of the mountain of knives, the sword tree hell, the fire sea hell, the ice hell, and many others. Finally, they came to a hell where two ghosts were boiling a pot of oil. The lazy ghosts. Had let the fire go out, and the oil wasn't even simmering. What are you two doing? Said Sudarananda, fooling around and going to sleep. The two ghosts opened their eyes and said, "What do you care?" They said, "We are in no hurry. We are waiting for someone who isn't due for a long, long time." Who? Said Sudarananda. Shakyamuni Buddha's little brother, Sudarananda. If you must know, he said, he left home but seeks only the blessings of heavens and the five hundred goddesses. He's been living in heaven for a thousand years, but in his confusion, he will forget how to cultivate and will commit many offenses. This will create evil karma and drag him into the hells to be deep fried. In this very pot, every hair on Sudarananda's body stood straight up on end, and every paw ran with cold sweat. How could this happen to me? He mourned. From that moment on, he stopped cultivating for rebirth in the heavens, and resolved to end birth and death. Soon, he certified to a hardship. Sudarananda was extremely handsome. The Buddha had the thirty-two marks of a superman, and Sudarananda had thirty. Someone even mistook him for the Buddha. One day, Shariputra was debating with some non-Buddhists who were even more extreme than many hippies. They didn't wear any clothes at all. This is our original face, they said. Why disguise yourself by wearing clothes? Shariputra, although not very tall, was extremely intelligent. His replies left them speechless, as if they had no mouths at all. Later, when Sundarananda, who was tall and handsome, happened along, the nudist said, "If that shot like Bhikshu beat us, how could we possibly outtalk this tall one?" They bowed to Sundarananda as their teacher and left to home life. Sundarananda had a lot of faithful disciples, and their cultivation was very successful. This is the story of 
Sudarananda, who gave up his wife for the goddesses and then, fearing the hells, cultivated the way. Ananda. Ananda was the Buddha's cousin. His name means rejoicing and was chosen because he was born on the day the Buddha awoke to the unsurpassed enlightenment. Both his birth and the Buddha's realization were causes for rejoicing. Of all the great disciples, the venerable Ananda was foremost in learning. He edited and compiled all the Buddha's sutras and remembered clearly without ever forgetting all the Dharma the Buddha spoke. Ananda's memory was extremely accurate and his samadhi was firm. In fact, Ananda had eight inconceivable states. He never accepted special invitations. In the Suragama Sutra, we read that because he accepted a special lunch invitation, Ananda became involved in an unfortunate encounter with Matanji's daughter. Matanji used a Brahma Heaven mantra to lure Ananda into a house of prostitution. Then the Buddha spoke the Suragama mantra and ordered Manjushri Bodhisattva to take the mantra to rescue him. Ananda never accepted another special invitation. They are too dangerous. For a member of the Sangha to go out alone to receive offerings from Dharma protecting laymen is called accepting special invitation and is against the Buddha's rules. If there are ten bishops but a layman favors only one with an invitation, he may not go. All ten must go. The venerable Ananda realized his mistake and never made it again. He never wore the Buddha's old clothes. The bishops liked to wear the Buddha's old clothing. Some even fought over it, feeling that wearing the Buddha's clothes would increase their wisdom and wipe away their offenses. Actually, they were just greedy. Ananda never wore them. He did not look at what he should not look at. What he was supposed to see, he looked at. What he was not supposed to see, he avoided. He did not look at what violated the code of morality, but looked only at what was in accord with it. He did not give rise to defied thoughts. The vulnerable Ananda followed the Buddha to the heavens, to the palace of the Asuras, and to the palace of the dragons. He saw the heavenly women, the Asura women and the dragon women, the most beautiful women in all of creation, but felt no sexual desire. He knew which Samandhi the Buddha had entered. The other bishops didn't know. He knew the benefits received by the beings who were touched and transformed by the Buddha in Samadhi. He understood completely all the Dharma the Buddha spoke. He never had to ask to have a Dharma repeated. He remembered it all and never needed to hear one twice. No one but Ananda had these eight inconceivable states. Concerning not accepting special invitations, Shramanuras cannot eat or drink when they please, but must eat with the assembly. Novices and bishops alike cannot live with a group and yet eat separately. Even a cup of tea should be taken with the group without assuming a special style. If everyone doesn't receive an apple, an orange, or even a piece of candy, no single person is allowed to eat them on his own. Rahula, the Buddha's father, King Suddhodana, was afraid that his son, the prince, would leave the home life. When the prince was still quite young, his father told him to marry, and he wed Yasudhara. When he was 19, he left home, and as he was about to go, his wife told him she wanted a son. The prince thereupon pointed his finger at her, and she became pregnant. Then he left for the snow mountains to meditate for six years, and for six years Rahula, his son, lay in his mother's womb. Rahula means obstacle. He had locked up a mouse hole for six days in a past life 
and so he saved six years of retribution, suffering in the womb. When he was finally born, he caused a lot of trouble for his mother, King Sudodana, and the whole family were upset. Well, I never, they said, without a husband. She gives birth to a son. Yashodara has obviously been running around. She must have a boyfriend. She's a bad woman, pronounced the entire clan. One servant spoke in her defense. You're wrong, she said. She's pure. She stays home all day long and doesn't flirt with men. The child really is the prince. No one believed the servant, and they wanted to kill Yashodara to beat her to death. Finally, they dug a pit. They dug a pit, built a fire in it, and prepared to throw Yashu, Yasudara and her baby in. Yasudara stepped forward and made a vow. Heaven spirits, earth spirits, bear witness. If the child belongs to the prince, my son and I will not be burned. If I did transgress, we both will burn. Then she jumped into the pit. What do you think happened? The pit turned into a pool of water, and a golden lotus grew out of it to catch them. Everyone then knew that the child was truly the son of the Buddha. When the Buddha returned to the palace, Yasudara took Rahula to meet him. If the child had been illegitimate, she certainly would have feared the Buddha. But she sent the child out to meet him, and the Buddha hugged the child. Rahula sought the true, the true way and worked hard. Among the great disciples, he was foremost in secret practices. He worked everywhere at all times, but no one knew he was working because he never advertised his cultivation. His work was so secret that he could enter somebody any place at all, even on the toilet. And no one knew. Also, Rahula was the Buddha's son. The Buddha doesn't have only one son. He has three kinds of sons, true sons. One are often reads the sutras headed by the Dharma Prince Manjushri. The Buddha is the Dharma King, and the Bodhisattvas are the Buddha's genuine sons, initiate sons. These are the ahas. Who, out of ignorance, hold to the principle of one-sided emptiness and have not attained the principle of the middle way. Uninitiate sons, common men who do not know how to cultivate, are upside down, but they are still the Buddha's sons. For the Buddha is the great compassionate father of all living beings. The wonderful Dharma Lotus Blossom Sutra speaks of us as poor lost sons. We should quickly return to our great compassionate father. We all have a share in the Buddha's family. Gavampati, this venerable one's very strange name means cow cut. Far in the distant past, he had insulted a bhikshu who couldn't eat hard things and had to slurp his food because his teeth were no good. You eat like. A cow said, "Gavampati, the old bishu happened to be a pratyeka Buddha, and because of Gavampati's careless slander, Gavampati was reborn for five hundred lifetimes as a cow and got to know the real bitterness that it involved. Finally, he met Shakyamuni Buddha, learned to cultivate and attend a hard trip. Although he had a certified." To the fruit, his habits from so many lives remained unchanged, and all day he snorted like a cow chewing its cud. Shakyamuni Buddha was afraid that someone might slander him and reap the same reward, and so he sent the venerable Gavampati to heaven to live. There he became the foremost of those who receive the offerings of the gods. We should take care not to speak rashly or to scold others. If you berate others, others will berate you. Pindola Bharadvaya. Pindola Bharadvaya means unmoving sharp roots. 
To the present day, he has not entered Nirvana because he broke a rule. Although the Arhats around the Buddha had spiritual powers, they were not allowed to display them casually. Once an elder called Yi Otiska carved a bowl out of sandal wood, put it on top of a high pole, and said, "Whoever can use his spiritual powers to get the bowl down can have it." Pindola Bharat Baya couldn't resist the temptation and used his powers to get the bowl down. Since you were so greedy for sandal wood bowls. That you display your spiritual powers," said the Buddha. "You will not be allowed to enter Nirvana. Instead, you must stay here and be a field of blessedness for living beings." Pindola Badavara is still in the world, but no one knows where. Whenever people make offerings to the Triple Jewel, however, he comes to receive them, acting as a field of blessedness for beings. In the drama ending age, Kalo Dayin. Kalo Dayin means black light. His skin was black, but his body glowed, and his eyes emitted light. One night, as he was out walking, a pregnant woman was so startled to see his two bright eyes and black lit body that she had a miscarriage and died. Because of this, the Buddha set up a precept forbidding Ramanas to take walks at night. Black light served the Buddha as an attendant and a drama protector. He was the foremost teacher who touched and transformed the greatest number of people, creating over one thousand certified sages. Maha Kavina. Maha means great, and Kavina means constellation. His father and mother prayed to one of the twenty-eight constellations in order to have their son. He was foremost in knowledge of astro astrology. Vakula Vakula means good berry. He was extremely handsome. In the past, during the time of the Pasin Buddha, he made offerings to the Indian a、uh, Haritaki fruit. So a pratika Buddha, a sage enlightened to conditions. Because of this, he received the retribution of long life in every life from ninety-one ends. For most of the disciples in age, he lived to be a hundred and sixty. In past lives, Vakula kept the precept against killing so conscientiously that he never killed a single creature, not even grass or trees. Thus, he obtained five kinds of death, free retribution. Vakula was a strange child. He was not born crying like most children, but entered the world smiling. Not only was he smiling, he was sitting upright in full lotus. Seeing this, his mother exclaimed, "He's a monster!" and threw him on the brazier to burn. After three or four hours, he had been burned. He just sat there in full lotus, laughing. Fully convinced that he was a monster, she then tried to boil him. When she took the cover off the pot several hours later, he just smiled back at her. "Oh no!" she cried and threw him into the ocean. He did not drown, however, because a big fish swam up and swallowed him whole. Then a man netted. The fist and cut it open. Bakula stepped out unharmed by the knife. So the fire didn't burn him, the water didn't boil him, the ocean didn't drown him, the fish didn't chomp him to death, and the fisherman's knife didn't cut him. Because he kept the precept against killing in every life, he obtained these five kinds of death free retribution. Aniruddha. Aniruddha means not poor. Long ago, during the time of Putia Buddha, a famine starved the people and reduced them to eating grass, roots, and leaves. It was the practice of a Pratika Buddha who lived at that time to go out begging only once every two weeks. If he received no offerings, he simply didn't eat. Once, 
One day he went out down the mountain to beg, and having received no offerings, was returning with his empty bowl when he was seen by a poor farmer, Aniruddha. The poor farmer addressed the Pratika Buddha most respectfully. Holy Master, he said, you received no offerings. Won't you please accept my lunch? As I'm very poor, I can only offer you this cheap bread of rice. But if you want it, you can have it. Seeing his sincerity, the Pratika Buddha accepted. After eating, he ascended into empty space, manifested the eighteen miraculous changes, and left. Just then, the poor farmer saw a rabbit running towards him. The rabbit jumped up on his back, and no matter how the farmer tried to knock, brush, or shake it off, it wouldn't budge. All alone in the field and terrified, he ran home. When he got there, the rabbit had turned into a gold statue. He asked his wife to knock the rabbit off, but she couldn't move it either. When they broke a gold leg off the rabbit, another would grow back in its place. In this way, the gold statue was never exhausted, and for ninety-one compas, Aniruddha was not poor. During the time of Shakyamuni Buddha, he was the son of the Buddha's father's brother, the Red Rice King. He was the Buddha's first cousin. Although he wasn't poor, Aniruddha liked to sleep. When the Buddha lectured on the sutras, one day the Buddha scolded him, "Hey, hey, how can you sleep like an oyster or a clam? Sleep, sleep for a thousand years, but you never hear the Buddha's name." Hearing this, Aniruddha became extremely vigorous and didn't sleep for seven days. As a consequence, he went blind. The Buddha took pity on him and taught him how to cultivate the vira illuminating bright samadhi. He immediately obtained the penetration of the heavenly eye. He could see the great trichilocosm as clearly as seeing an apple held in his hand, and was foremost of the disciples in possessing the heavenly eye.